Good morning. In the spirit of the living God who reminds us to love all of God's people, we remember that when settlers came, they were met by others who were already here, already knew these lands, already lived rich and full lives based on ancient and proud cultures. This is the land we share. Camrose United Church is located on land encompassed by Treaty 6 that was a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Assiniboine, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. I acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. And I affirm my commitment to the principles and actions of reconciliation. As we begin our worship today, we light the Christ candle. This candle that reminds us of God's presence around us, among us, within us. And I invite us to take a moment as we prepare to celebrate God's presence in our community. Today, we take another step along the road of Advent, surrounded by the color of blue, of waiting. We make our way toward the celebration of Christ's birth as we do every year. While we wait and journey, we remember. We look for signposts for what is to come. We move forward knowing that something special is in the air. We remind each other that on the unpredictable road of life, we need to rely on each other. We need to trust each other. We need to know that faith will guide us to the place we all long to be. We ground ourselves in hope. Hope that we will find company on the journey. Hope that the world can be a better place with reliability, trust, faithfulness by our side and in our hearts. Hope that the possibility of God's loving world growing gets a little bit closer the more we look for the good in each other. Let's hear God's voice leading us into possibilities, into wonder, into hope. I invite us to sing together out of Voices United, number 229, God of the Sparrow. Just 
Each week through Advent, the light of the Christ candle shows us something God would like us to learn about. Last week, we lit the candle of peace. Today, Christ's light shows us hope. You got it. Hope is something invisible but the spark of it lights up the world and invites us to dream of possibilities. God asks us to be people who remember the lessons of the past, people who look to the future, people who work on achieving goodness, people who make the world a safe place. Hope calls out to us so that we may help it transform the world. I invite us to stay seated as we sing Hope is the Star. Christmas Candle by Richard Paul Evans, illustrated by Jacob Collins. On a snowy Christmas Eve, a young man made his way along a dark, deserted cobblestone street. His name was Thomas, and he was wrapped in a woolen cloak, a knapsack flung across his back. In his hand hung a tin candle lantern, and behind the lantern's glass pane sat the remains of a spent candle. When he saw the glow of candlelight through the shop window of the chandler, the village candlemaker, 
he hurried his steps, turning onto the snow-covered pathway. In Thomas's way stood a beggar, shaking his cup for coins, and Thomas pushed him aside impatiently and opened the door to the shop. Inside the shop, metal rods filled with tallow and beeswax hung from a stone hearth. The old chandler stood with his sculptor's tools in his hands, surrounded by the beautiful creations he had made out of wax. I am lucky to find you here, Thomas said. The town is empty. The old man gazed silently at Thomas as the young man glanced about at the rows of sculpted candles. There were sprites and fairies, angels with see-through wings, and fragile princesses in gowns as delicate as lace. They smelled of myrrh and frankincense and meadow flowers. You are a foolish old man, Thomas said. You spend hours making beautiful things that devour themselves. How long before the flame melts an angel into an ugly clump of wax? He pointed to a row of simpler candles. I only need light. I will take one of those. The chandler looked steadily at Thomas. The Christmas candles are of no good to you. Thomas was startled by the stern response, but he laughed. It would do me much good not to stumble in the dark. Are you playing me, old man? I will not pay more for your candle than it is worth. It is only four coppers, but you may find it costly. The old man's words were strangely serious. I have money. Give me the candle, Thomas shouted. It is late and my family is waiting for me. I need illumination to find my way. Then it is illumination you desire, the chandler asked softly. That's what I need, Thomas replied. The candle maker nodded slowly. So you do. He took a candle, dipped it over a flame, and then placed it inside the lantern's tim frame. Thomas dropped some coins on the counter and walked to the door. The old man's lips pursed in an odd, amused smile. Merry Christmas, my brother, he said. The farewell surprised Thomas. To you as well, he stammered, and he hastily stepped out into the darkness, the lantern lighting the road ahead. Thomas had travelled only a short distance when a shadow emerged from an alleyway. A robber, he thought fearfully, and he held out his lantern. Who's there, he called. Then in the light of the candle, he saw it was only a frail woman huddled against the cold. Sir, cried the woman, a pence, please. His eyes narrowed in contempt at the beggar, and then as he looked at her more closely, he gasped. He knew the face well. It was his own mother. Mother, what is this prank? Why do you greet me as a beggar? The woman stared at him. Just to happen, sir. Why are you here? Where are my brothers, my sister? Thomas asked. He reached out to her, but she pulled away. Mother, how peculiar you act. You will catch a chill. Here, take my cloak. He removed it and held it out to her. Cautiously, the woman came forward, then snatched the coat and retreated into the shadows. But as she moved from the lantern's light, her appearance changed, and she was not his mother, but a beggar indeed. With Thomas's cloak in hand, she disappeared into the darkness. A strange trick, he said to himself. He wrapped his arms around his chest, wishing he had kept his cloak. It is I who will catch a chill. Thomas walked on, quickening his pace against the frigid air. As he passed beneath the awning of a darkened inn, the candle revealed another form lying in the gutter. He held out the candle and again gasped. Has the universe gone mad? Elon, my brother, are you sick? He set the lantern down and pulled his brother's limp arm around his shoulder, struggling to lift him. Elon, I cannot carry you. He pounded on the inn's door, which was opened by a grim-faced woman. My brother is sick, and I fear he will freeze before I can come back for him. May I bring him inside? For the price of a night, she cackled, a shilling. A shilling. Thomas reached into his pocket. I only have sixpence. 
The old woman scowled and began to shut the door. Wait! My knapsack is worth more than a shilling, Thomas cried, and the trousers inside are newly tailored. I will give you everything. The old innkeeper looked at the bundle and read, reached out a fat hand. Thomas flung his knapsack from his back and handed it to her with the last of his money, and she opened the door. Bring him in. Leaving the lantern on the curb, Thomas dragged the man into the inn's foyer, and as he gently laid him on the wooden floor, he suddenly saw that the man's face, like the beggar's, had changed. So, it is your brother who lay in my gutter, croaked the woman. Thomas gasped at the man. Ah, he is not my brother. You are mad, the woman muttered, and she showed him out the door. Outside, Thomas picked up his lantern. He looked into its glass panes. There is something strange about your light, he whispered. Thomas had just glimpsed the bright lights of home when he came across a little girl shivering out in the cold. Have you anything to eat, sir? She asked in a faint voice. Thomas felt a stir in his chest. This child was so tiny, no bigger than his sister, and suddenly he pulled the lantern away. He wouldn't shine it in her face. He could guess its trick. And what could he do for this poor waif? He had no food, no money left to give. I have nothing, Thomas murmured as he left her, willing himself not to turn around. Penniless and cold, Thomas nudged onward, hardly glancing at the familiar houses of his childhood. His own home was dressed for the season, and music and laughter came from inside. As he entered the foyer, his mother greeted him with great excitement. Thomas, she exclaimed, you have arrived. Hearing her cry, his sister and brothers rushed into the room to welcome his arrival. And when the joviality had begun to settle, his mother looked at him peculiarly. Thomas, where is your cloak? <coughs> yes, said his brother Elan. Why have you no pack? Thomas gazed solemnly into their bewildered faces. I, I gave everything away, he said. To whom? his mother asked, puzzled. Thomas looked down at the waning Christmas candle. The old man spoke the truth. You are costly. A smile of understanding slowly spread across his faith. face, but of great worth. What's the riddle? What's the old man? He's a wise man who sculpts candles, Thomas replied as he gazed at the face of his sister. And just then in his mind, her bright face became the woeful, hungry face of the poor child in the cold. And Thomas looked at the sumptuous banquet laid out on the table and he turned to the door. Thomas, where are you going? his sister asked. I must see about another member of our family, he said. And as he left the warm, fragrant house for the cold night, Thomas's heart was warm with joy. For that Christmas Eve, a lesson was learned and taken to heart. If we will see things as they truly are, we will find that all, from great to small, belong to one family. And this truth known from the beginning of time, is perhaps best seen in the joyous illumination of Christmas. It is often in the simple things that we find the truth. It is often in the simple things that God speaks to us, inviting us to see where hope is needed. How are you offering hope to God's world? Answer this one. Where have you seen signs of hope in the world lately? Have you seen signs of hope in the world lately? If you were here last week and you saw a whole church full of people at a music concert, you would have felt the hope. It was awesome. I saw hope in um, the firemen and the other people standing in the middle of the highway as they were collecting toys and gifts. 
right in the middle of our place. I see hope in the request from the um, refugee family um, supporters who are asking for things. There's a list on the board downstairs. It's not a huge list. That gives me hope because so much stuff has already been given. There's hope in that. Where have you seen hope in the world lately? Last week, we brought a sparkle box into the Advent journey space. It's sitting at the front right now. I'll take it down to coffee afterwards. We are invited to put into the sparkle box people and places where we can see that they are giving of their time and their treasure to look after others as gifts to God. These are our gifts to the Christ child. Where are we seeing our faith come alive in the world? You can add here. We'll take it downstairs. There'll be stuff there. The children's families are all getting sparkle boxes too, and so we're inviting them to take a look to see where they see good stuff happening. And on Christmas Eve, we will take a look at our sparkle box and see where God's hope and peace and joy and love are well and alive in the world. And we sing. Our first reading today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 to 10, from the easy-to-read version. The King of Peace is coming. A small tree will begin to grow from the stump of Jesse. That branch will grow from Jesse's roots. The Lord's Spirit will always be with that new king to give him wisdom understanding, guidance, and power. The Spirit will help him know and respect the Lord. He will find joy in obeying the Lord. This king will not judge people by the way things look. He will not judge by listening to rumors. He will judge the poor fairly and honestly. He will be fair when he decides what to do for the poor of the land. If he decides people should be beaten, he will give the command, and they will be beaten. If he decides people must die, he will give the command, and those evil people will be killed. Goodness and fairness will be like a belt he wears around his waist. Then wolves will live at peace with lambs, and leopards will lie down in peace among with the young goats. Calves, lions, and bulls will all live together in peace. A little child will lead them. Bears and cattle will eat together in peace, and all their young will lie down together and will not hurt each other. Lions will eat hay like cattle. Even snakes will not hurt people. Babies babies will be able to play near a cobra's hole and put their hands into the nest of a poisonous snake. People will stop hurting each other. People on my holy mountain will not want to destroy things because they will know the Lord. The world will be full of knowledge about him, like the sea is full of water. At that time, there will be someone special from Jesse's family. He will be like a flag that all the nations gather around. The nations will come to him and ask him what they should do, and the place where he is will be filled with glory.
From the words of hope that the prophet Isaiah shares with us, we hear God's hope. We hear God's dream for the world that somehow people would listen and learn and get along. That leadership would be fair and honest. As we hear these words, do we realize that the people who are to be fair and honest, listening and learning to God, are us? We are among the many invited into God's dream, God's hope for the world. Would you join your hearts and voices with mine in the prayer for awareness and for God's grace? Holy One, we travel again the road of Advent, of preparation to receive your gift of love. We do not doubt that the gift will come. We do not doubt you. But we do not always cooperate in your dreams as well as we could. There are times when we seem to be more willing to argue than to listen. There are times when we don't look for opportunities to get to know new people, to hear their story. There are times when we get so caught up in returning to what was that we don't hear your voice pulling us into what could be. Forgive us, God, for those times when we have hidden into ourselves and let go of actively living love in the world. For those times when we have forgotten how to see hope, how to be hope in your world. For those times when we have relinquished the opportunity to be partners in bringing your dream to life. Holy God, reset our steps onto the paths of loving so that we may always journey with you. Amen. The words of the prophet give us hope. We are told that God's spirit will be with growing people giving them wisdom, understanding, guidance, and power, and that joy can be found in following God's way. They tell us that it is possible for all people to get along. Hear these words that remind us of God's love, of God's dreams, and invite us to be part of them. God will be there with us, showing us the way. This is God's promise. God is with us. We are never alone. Thanks be to God. Just when we truly needed peace, when our hearts were lost and forlorn, When we needed comfort and calm, the Son of God was born. Just when we truly needed hope, we needed hope when our hearts were weak. When we needed a light in the dark, the Son of God was born. Just when we needed a song to sing, just when we needed a sign, God sent us a child. Trembling and torn, 
Just when we needed to see a new star, the Son of God, the Son of God, the Son of God was born. Our gospel reading today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Once again, the easy-to-read version. John prepares the way for Jesus. When it was the right time, John the baptizer began telling people a message from God. This was out in the desert area of Judea. John said, change your hearts and lives because God's kingdom is now very near. John is the one Isaiah the prophet was talking about when he said, There was someone shouting in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make the road straight for him. John's clothes were made from camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. For food he ate locusts and wild honey. People came to John from Jerusalem and the rest of Judea, and from all of the areas along the Jordan River. They confessed the bad things they had done, and John baptized them in the Jordan. Many Pharisees and Sadducees came to where John was baptizing people. When John saw them, he said, You are all snakes. Who warned you to run from God's judgment that is coming? Change your hearts, and show by the way you live that you have changed. I know what you are thinking. You want to say, but Abraham is our father. That means nothing. I tell you, God could make children for Abraham from these rocks. The axe is now ready to cut down the trees. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water to show that you have changed your hearts and lives. But there is someone coming later who is able to do more than I can. I am not good enough to be the slave who takes off his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He will come ready to clean the grain. He will separate the good grain from the straw, and he will put the good part into his barn. Then he will burn the useless part with a fire that cannot be stopped. Scripture is our song for the journey, passed on from generation to generation to guide and inspire. God calls us to be doers of the word and And not hearers only. You know, sometimes when we get these scriptures, I wonder who chose them. Because I take from a list. And how do you deal with some of that stuff that's the hard stuff? The stuff where the fire comes and takes people. So I'm going to be honest and say that sometimes I don't. I just don't. I don't want to go there. But as I look at it, as I read the story, and I read um, with the lens of where we are and who we are and what our focus is, something comes out of it. And so hopefully today what came out of those stories will bring hope for you or help you find hope. Many of our scriptures are wrapped around the society, knowledge, and experience of their day. In our story from Isaiah, the stump was alluding to the rulers who had followed King David. And Isaiah was speaking to the people of Judah who were living in exile in Babylon. See how you need to know your history? And they might have been thinking that the dynasty of David had ended in disaster. How could anyone find a way out of this? Yet from that unexpected and ugly time in their history, hope would peek in. Isaiah named it as a shoot. 
life coming from what was thought to be dead. He said that God would give this new life all that it needed to grow and was very clear about the power of God's spirit and God's intent for peace for all creation. This was hope for those who had given up on recreating their way of life as it was. This was hope moving them into a new and different future. In this story, we can see that there is hope that God will bring about fairness and justice. There is hope that God can renew relationships and that friends and neighbors will be found in the unexpected. From Matthew, we hear words of John the Baptist. We know John to have been less than a genteel fellow, rough and gruff, no political correctness in his view of life but faithful. Oh, so faithful. John is the one who looks with hope to the future. John is the one who sees promise approaching. John is the one who reminds people to live faithfully with integrity. John is the one who trusts in God's vision of peace and knows, hopes, that if more people would do the same, a wonderful world community of God could be born. In Isaiah, an ugly situation offers a place for something new to grow. In Matthew, the outspoken and abrasive John opens the door for new faith to enter in. Hope leads us forward. But it often means that we have to be willing to move without knowing the why or the how or the when. This week I was able to be part of two conversations that included hope. Specifically, there was more. Neither of these conversations were in places of absolute disaster, but they were alert enough to recognize challenging places and spaces in the world around us. It was recognized that everything is changing, that the church is in a huge upheaval as it re-examines its role in society. If we are to be the voice for those who are displaced or inspiration to those who have become complacent, then we need to rethink who we are. Like the Israelites in Babylon, our world may have changed irrevocably, but that doesn't mean that there isn't hope on the horizon. There are new ideas, new opportunities coming our way that have God's spirit and dream of peace inspiring them. To flourish in the world, hope needs an openness to understanding, a willingness to have faith in the impossible, courage to let go, humbleness to embrace. Have there been times when we have felt ourselves slipping away from faithfulness, from courage, from humility? In these times, do we know that we are stepping back from hope? Stepping back from sharing hope and receiving hope. Have there been times when we have been surprised by the signs of hopefulness, of caring and partnership in our community? This week in the life of a world that continues on a chaotic, chaotic journey, there have been signs of hope. And this is what I saw this week as I looked for hope. People fed in our community through Martha's Table, the food bank, spaghetti suppers. Many gifts and supports in help welcoming Ukrainian refugees to our community. People stepping up in our church to move tables and chairs, to work our sound booth, thanks Terry, to offer hospitality, to do a little snow shoveling. People returning to worship and staying for coffee. Yay! Honestly, I think that's the biggest sign of hope we've got, is the coffee. A great turnout for a wonderful evening of music featuring the talents of voice choirs and the handbell choir. 
decorating for the Christmas season continues to emerge every day in our community. A sure sign of hope that we know our story continues, even among the chaos. I was in the church last night, about nine o'clock or so. There was nobody else on Main Street. But all of the trees were sparkling. They're all wrapped around the trunks with the colors. And the red and green twinkled in that emptiness. And I thought, man, isn't that awesome? Isn't that beautiful? And it's just a a thing that just kind of settles you in there. It's beautiful. In the wider world, there are stories of communities rallying together to offer hospitality to others caught in winter storms. There was a story of a child born in a car and a stranger stopped to help. Stories of church buildings being repurposed to house the homeless. Each one of us can be a carrier of hope in the world. Each one of us can be the voice of hope in the world. Each one of us has the potential to unlock the mystery of hope from its hidden places. From the stump comes hope. From the unexpected comes hope. From God comes hope. May it ever be so. Amen. In the bulb there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterfly. Will soon be free in the cold and snow of winter. There's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until its season. Something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you. share with you a story of hope. And specifically, I want to talk to you a little bit about the United Church of Canada. There are many people who look into our chaotic world and wonder how we will survive. There are many places, the church included, that now need to reimagine what they offer to the world and how they offer that to the world as they respond to changing needs and circumstances. Hope is what moves us forward to answer those questions. And from the United Church of Canada, we hear these words of hope to inspire us. The United Church of Canada is a community of hope, a vibrant and vital church with both purpose and vision. We live in a time of rapid change in religious life, great inequities between peoples and collective harm to our earth community. As a church, we have been complicit in injustice, and yet... We have this hope. We believe we continue to be called to witness in love and justice to the liberating, healing Christ risen in this place and time. Together we strive towards repentance, repair, and right relations with all peoples and the planet. Our call and vision statement speaks to how we boldly embody the Christian story in this time, filled with the certainty of resurrection and hope for new life. 
living purposefully into this call and vision anticipates becoming what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others called the beloved community. The ever inbreaking, ever transforming, ever reconciling realm of God realized in our time. The United Church of Canada call reflects the core of our purpose, sharing who we seek to be in such a time as this, which is a quote from Esther. The call is, and you've seen this in your bulletin and you've heard it a few times, deep spirituality, bold discipleship, daring justice. The United Church of Canada vision reflects what the church aspires to be over a five to ten year span. This is what we are hoping we will look like as a united church ten years from now. Called by God as disciples of Jesus, the United Church of Canada seeks to be a bold, connected, evolving church of diverse, courageous, hope-filled communities united in deep spirituality, inspiring worship, and daring justice. These words of hope, inspired by faithful witness in many times and places, can be our guidelines to be in God's witness, work, and word in the world. We can do this. God knows we can. We are called to offer hope to God's world. And a part of the hope that we offer are the offerings that we give whenever we can. We do not pass around the plate anymore. We have many people who offer us support in our church through um, pre-authorized remittances. Um, But we also have people who like to put their money in the plate. And so they are at the the door and will be collected afterwards. Please remind yourself that you do not have to pay for God's love. But when you do offer the pennies towards the work of the church, it helps us give the best that we can to the outside world, wherever that is. In the places where we can offer hearing and listening. In the places where we can offer food. This is what you support. And it gives us this church as a base for all of that to move into the community. We offer what we can so that others will experience the presence of God through us. We offer smiles and phone calls, Christmas cards. We can offer food and clothing to those who are struggling. We can share our treasure so that God's church can help those in need whom we may never meet. Together, may what we offer be enough to shine God's loving light through the world. Amen. Light is kindled in the darkness When our hope seems most absurd Beacons through a shrouded future and
justice and in wonder watch it grow as we gather flames together till they shine with warmth and light God dispels the night of hatred and the blaze of love burns bright At this table where God hosts us with love every child of God is welcome here God created us. God knows us. God invites us to be part of a family and we continue our Advent journey together as family in different times and places on our way. Some of us are sitting in our homes. Some of us are gathered in our worship space. All of us, whoever we are and wherever we are, are with God. In this sacramental meal, we share together our souls are blessed by hope and the love of God found in the simple things of life. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our God. When we gather at God's table, either individually or one-on-one on one, one on one with God or with our siblings in God's family, we pause to remember all that God has done and all that God is doing right now. It is here we give thanks for all that lives and breathes. We give thanks even for endings that create space for newness and wonder to come. We give thanks for all the ways in which God introduces compassion and connection into our world and for every time we are reminded that God finds a way out of no way. We give thanks for our creator and the endless work of redemption and renewal that builds us and holds us together. We give thanks for Jesus and the path of love and learning he invites us onto every day. We give thanks for the Spirit, whose presence guides us and bonds us in deeper communion. We give thanks to you, O oh God. Amen. Remember that Jesus invited his friends to God's table. Knowing that life was full of challenge, he reminded them of their commitment to follow God's teachings, to live and learn together so that the world could grow into God's vision of love. Through his words and actions, Jesus offered God's hope to all people. He shared food with followers and friends, with saints and sinners. On a hillside, and a few friends in an upper room. He took a piece of bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Then he took a cup. And after giving thanks, he passed it among them, saying, Drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Through this bread and cup, Jesus lives within us. In our words and actions, Jesus lives among us. Let us pray. 
Eternal God, you invite us to your table. And we remember that your table is so large that it has room for the whole earth. We remember that the church has a purpose to nurture faith and comfort hearts, to share gifts for the good of all, to resist forces that exploit and marginalize, to be fierce love in the face of violence, to defend all human dignity, loving the world as you do, as Jesus taught us, may our actions be earth's healing. Amen. Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and cup, the gifts we have and hold before us. Let us share your bread and taste the bread of life. Let us drink from this cup and gain hope for the journey. May this sharing of your gifts broaden the way we think, deepen the way we feel, and send us out walking, running, praying, and giving to the world as we share in the work of creation with you. Let us receive with thanksgiving the gifts you have provided, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray in the name of the one who breathes hope and peace into our fear, who encourages us to pray together as we sing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so together we eat at God's table, bread for the journey, the cup of blessing, the gifts of God for the people of God. Bread for the journey. Thanks be to God. cup and gift of blessing. Thanks be to God. And we pray. At our tables, wherever we are, may God be our guest this day and always that we may welcome hope, peace, joy, and love into our lives and become hosts to all of God's people. 
God of hope, guide us to the stables of our world where the lonely and longing gather. Lead us to the mangers of our time where hope and renewal are born again. Make us heralds of your love and joy. Amen. During this Advent journey, know that God's love travels with us. We are God's beloved. Our faith and our God weaves into our life peace, hope, joy, and love. Thanks be to God. This is the light of Christ that is shining into all of the corners of the earth, showing us where we are and where we are meant to be. The Spirit of God. The peace of God. The hope of God. Breathe it in. And know that God is indeed with us wherever we go. Amen. <laughs>